Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. We continue in this uh, series in uh, First Seth Thessalonians. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, so we're, we're doing First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians. They're two books that Paul wrote to the church, this early church, this new church plant, actually, that he began in uh, Thessalonica. And so that's what we're working through, and we'll be working through throughout the summer. So I'm glad you're with us this morning. You, If this is your first time with us, you're jumping into kind of a mysterious, uh, somewhat complex passage of Scripture this morning. It talks about the second coming of Jesus, and um, you know as well as I do, Throughout history, there's always been a fascination, hasn't there, with predictions for the future, predictions of when Jesus is going to return. And the Bible's very clear that Jesus is going to one day return and he's going to establish his kingdom on earth. And Paul references this throughout this, these two letters. And even at the very beginning in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Paul says this, that we're to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. So the certainty of the return of Jesus is clearly stated throughout all of Scripture. This is not a minor truth. This is not just a, you know, where the Bible talks about it a couple of times. Let me give you an example of this. So, for instance, you probably didn't realize this about your Bibles, but 23 of the 27 books in the New Testament state that Jesus is coming again. One out of every 30 verses in the New Testament either speak directly of his coming or of the end time surrounding his coming. So for every biblical reference to Jesus' first coming, there are eight references that point to his return, his second coming. So clearly the biblical writers did not want us to miss this truth. So from the perspective of biblical authors... Jesus' coming was never intended to be uh, subject for speculation, okay? It's always intended to be reason for anticipation and for motivation. And so this awareness of Jesus' imminent return is, is vividly portrayed throughout these letters that we've been looking at. And this is why Paul is so concerned, when we looked at last week, Paul was so concerned about the church there because so many in the church, uh, knowing that Jesus was going to return, they thought, well, he's just going to return like tomorrow. And uh, so they, some of them left their jobs and they're becoming a burden to the church because they couldn't feed themselves. They were not loving one another as they once did. They were kind of sitting around with a lot of time on their hands and they were uh, busy bodying and gossiping and trying to find the goods on everyone. And so this is what was happening in the church. And so Paul wants to teach them, and he wants them to know that the, the return of Jesus is not a time for you to sit back and do nothing. It's a time of anticipation. It's a time of motivation that I want you to continue to grow more and more in light of the return of Jesus. So that's where we're, our, we are today. So Paul kind of shifts his letter now to the second coming of Jesus. So here's our big idea this morning. It's this. The reason for this is that God's promises about tomorrow give us hope for how we face today. The reason that Paul shifts his teaching to the coming of Jesus is that God's promises about tomorrow give us hope for how we face today. Now, following our message this morning, we're going to be trying something uh, new that we haven't done before, and that is just going to have a few minutes, uh, maybe five minutes of time for you to uh, be able to share uh, maybe an encouragement, or maybe if you have a question specific to the sermon, or uh, a word, uh, a piece of some scripture that you read this morning that you want to encourage the body with, sort of like like open mic, okay? Um, and so Tony will have a mic and he'll be going around. You just can flag him down. So we'll do that at the end. It just gives you a chance to think about that a little bit. Uh, maybe something that God's teaching you, that you're learning, something that's stuck out to you from our passage this morning. And so that's kind of where we're going. So just, just to let you know, that's going to happen afterwards and we'll see, see how it goes. So it's not karaoke, so don't get carried away. All right. So this text that we're looking at this morning is probably one of the most well-known in the book of 1 Thessalonians. And it's well-known because there's sort of this mysterious nature to what Paul describes about the second coming of Jesus. And, And he describes it, he says that Christians dead and alive will be caught up together with him. 
caught up together with him. And this is this idea of being caught up together with Jesus is the basis for the New Testament doctrine of uh, referred to as the rapture. You maybe you've heard that before. So rapture comes from the Latin Vulgate, and it, it means to be caught up with. And so that's where we get the English word rapture from. So human beings have always had an insatiable curiosity for the future. Looking into the future is a multi-billion dollar business. And it's full of quacks and nut jobs. Okay, so, so throughout history, there's been no shortage of predictions of when Jesus is going to return, right? Dates are set, dates are past, right? Dates are set, dates are past. One of the most popular uh, end time predictors was the 700 Club's uh, Pat Robinson. Uh, so this guy in 1976, he, pr- he predicted that Jesus was going to return in 1982. 1982 has come and gone. And Jesus has not returned. In his 1990 book, The New Millennium, Robertson suggests the date as the date, the date for Earth's destruction would be 2007. We're still here. Over two, Pat. Okay. Another, another end times uh, predictor kind of uh, throughout time has always been predicting is this man by the name of Harold Camping. All right, this guy has had, had it wrong so many times you'd think he'd th- throw in the towel on this, but he keeps going. So he predicted that the rapture would occur on uh, the 6th of September, 1994. When it didn't occur, he, he, it, and it didn't happen, he changed the date to the 29th, okay? And, and, and then to the 2nd of October, so I guess if you don't get it right, you just keep bumping the date, you know? And, uh, and then his fourth prediction, when he, uh, he finally ended and predicted the date of March 31st, 1995. But his last prediction came in 2011. So this guy's been wrong on every account. So Camping predicted that the rapture and the devastating earthquakes, they'd occur on May the 21st, 2011, And God would take approximately 3% of the world's population into heaven. And the end of the world would occur five months later on October 21st. This is his prediction. Now, when his original prediction failed to come about, he kind of revised it. That's what you do if you're into this business. If it doesn't work out, you revise it. You come up with a reason why it wouldn't work out. And and he's been wrong over and over and over and over again. Now, I know you've all been waiting and you want to hear, well... We're, we we want to know what is your end times prediction. You're all wanting to know that. I know you're on bended knee waiting. Okay, well, here's my end times prediction. My end times prediction is that end times prediction will continue as long as they sell books. All right, that's my end times prediction. So so the point of this is to remind you and to write, remind me that even though there will always be people that say, you oh, know, Jesus is going to return here. The end of the world is going to be here. They're going to attempt to make predictions about Jesus and write books about Jesus. And they're going to have heavenly tourism and they're going to go visit Jesus and they're going to come back. And, and we should never think that Jesus' words about his return won't come true, even though there are people that make all kinds of crazy predictions. Jesus is going to return. This is a fact, and we don't know when he's going to return. Matthew 24, 36 to 39 says, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So it'll be the coming of the Son of Man. So what I'd like to do as we talk about this this morning is to avoid excessiveness and unhealthy curiosity in the area of the end times. And we're going to learn a powerful truth about what Paul wants to teach us about the Lord's return in Scripture today. Now, we're going to be... uh, Paul doesn't write this to give us an expansive view of the end times. There's a few verses here that he talks about this, and there's a few verses spattered throughout 
First uh, and Second Thessalonians. That's not Paul's intention is to give us a comprehensive view of the end times here. That's not what he's trying to do. And so it's important to remember that. It's easy for us with this, with this unhealthy curiosity and speculation and you open up the newspaper and you go, oh my gosh, you know, the end times is coming because this has happened and it's going to happen, you know, on Friday and all this stuff. So what we have before us, okay, is some truth that Paul wants to communicate to the Seth Thessalonian church and to us. It was not written to us, but it is written for us. And there's a truth here that Paul wants to communicate because the church in Thessalonica was really struggling. And they were struggling with something in particular. They were struggling with the, this idea of Jesus' return. Remember, they're, they're sort of sitting back. They think it's going to be like, like tomorrow. It's going to be the next day. And it, and it could be, but they just kind of left the responsibilities of what it means to be a Christ follower. And they sort of parked those things so they could just sit and wait for Jesus' return. And while they're sitting and waiting for Jesus' imminent return, they, they, they begin to have this dialogue because as they're waiting, people are dying. And they're asking this question is, what happens to those people that die before Jesus returns? That's the question they're wrestling with. That's the challenge that Paul wants to unpack for us and for them today because it was something that they were wrestling with. So let me pray for our morning. Father, thank you for this time and for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you like the psalm that says that our heart, Lord, is that we have, we have treasured your word in our heart that, that, that we may not sin against you. And I pray this morning, Lord, as we look at this challenging passage, that you would give us ears to hear ears to hear and a heart that's open to what you want to teach us this morning. We give you thanks, Lord, for the body of Christ. In your name, amen. Amen. All right. Wow. It's good stuff. All right. The, the Thessalonian church, remember, they're struggling. They're struggling. They've struggled with a number of things that Paul addresses. And they're struggling with this idea of what will happen to God's people who die before the return of Jesus. What's going to happen? And, and then to add to this confusion, so think of that. Now, to add to this confusion, consider this. This was something that was happening during this time as well. There were some false teachers, and they had constructed a letter, and they had signed the letter from the Apostle Paul. And they were going around and they were, they were showing people, hey, look, Paul wrote another letter for you. And it was all kind of false teaching. And it was like first century identity theft. And they had taken uh, Paul's identity and they had put it on this letter and they were passing it around. And people were being really confused about what it meant, that, that, uh, what was going on. In particular, they were teaching that the, the day of the Lord's judgment, that Jesus had already returned. Right? So this is creating great confusion for them because all the people that are sitting there uh, quit their jobs, not loving one another, uh, just, just kind of waiting for Jesus to return. They're going like, I, I missed the bus. What happened? Right? Paul says now that Jesus has already come and now I'm totally confused. And what happens to these people when they die? So you have, you have this situation, you have this false letter. And we know what, that this false letter was being passed around because in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 2, it says this. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So they're aware of this. There's a false teachers are spreading this letter around and uh, that's what's been going on. So so add to the uh, circulating letter, add to the confusion that's going on. The Thessalonian church was also in the midst of, of tremendous ongoing persecution and suffering. And, and some of these young believers were convinced that they had missed the rapture, that Jesus had in fact come, and that they were now experiencing the judgment of God upon them. The church was shaken and confused. The church was shaken and confused. Some of you might remember 22 years ago, there was the, uh, the classic <laughs> movie, Left Behind. No? Okay. Yeah. Tw okay. Left Behind. Everyone's like, I don't want to admit that I saw that. But uh, 
So 22 years ago, Left Behind came out with Kurt Cameron, classic. All right, so he was the lead in the movie. And then in 2014, Nicolas Cage, assuming trying to create a comeback, uh, did a remake. All right, pretty bad acting, not Oscar contenders by any stretch. Uh, but they do paint a, a, a picture of, uh, maybe a compelling picture of perhaps what the rapture would be like as described here. That people uh, are here one moment and gone the next. Right? That, that people that are alive are, are, are meet Jesus in the clouds and people that are dead, uh, their bodies go and they meet Jesus. And so there's this compelling, in the movies, right? Cars are driving, the rapture happens, cars go off the road because the drivers are gone, right? All the Christians are gone. And then, and then uh, uh, you know, planes are crashing. And, um, and, and, and what's, what I find really fascinating about these movies is that you always knew when someone was gone because there was a pile of clothes that was left there. And I thought to myself, won't that be quite a reception? All right, we're all going to heaven with no clothes on, and it's going to be quite the thing. So, so some of these young Thessalonian Christians, they thought to themselves, you know, maybe we're left behind. Maybe we're left behind. Maybe Jesus has already come and gone, and, and they missed it all. Great confusion. Now, with all the confusion, Paul wants to teach them some important truths, and he teaches them to address the confusion in two specific ways. The first one is this. He says, he will remind them of truths that they already know and firmly believe. He'll point them back to the historical fact of the cross and the resurrection. You'll see this in this passage, okay? And the second thing that he does is he further expands on truths that he's previously introduced by applying them to their current confusion. So he's going to point them forward to the promise of the glorious return of Jesus. So in other words, Paul's teaching them to look to look ahead and be grateful for what Jesus has done and to look ahead as well and be hopeful for what Jesus is going to do. So Paul answers the question, what happens to the dead in Christ? Verse 13, let's look at this together. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as, as others do, uh, do not grieve as others do who have no hope. And so Paul's making a connection here between their, the, their grief for those that have died and their, their hopelessness. Right? Their grief and their hopelessness was a direct result of their failure to understand death from God's perspective. Much like today in Paul's day, there's, there's this common idea that um, there's, there's no hope of life after death. This is it, right? This is it. Now, there's, there's unknowns, right? There's lots of unknowns. There's four unknowns, perhaps, that we, that we can wrestle with when it comes to death. One is this. We don't know really how we're born or, or, or how death works, right? We know, like, some things for sure, but we don't know all the, all the things that surround death, and there's lots of questions, and, and that's why, you know, the, uh, the, the aisle at the bookstore, the Christian book for, store for heavenly tourism, right, those people that go to heaven and come back, which is, just so you know, uh, that's getting bigger and bigger, because everybody wants to know, right, so, so we don't really know how it all works, okay, that's w- kind of one unknown about death, and we also, we have no control over what causes death, I mean, you know, if you eat badly, you're probably not going to live as long. But there are people that eat super healthy and they die young. And there's people that, I think of my brother who passed away. And he died of a, of a really rare cancer called mesothelioma. And it's, it's a cancer that you get when you're exposed to asbestos. He never worked in construction. He never worked around asbestos. He had to rack his brain to see if there's any way in his life that he bumped into in some way or is in the same room as asbestos, and yet he dies from this cancer. Weird, right? There's other people that have worked in rooms clouded gray with asbestos fiber, and they live long lives. We don't understand why or what causes death. Some, sometimes these just don't know some things. We just don't know. We have no control over who dies. We don't even know when we die. I mean, we could, we could die today. 
I mean, you might know a loved one, right? That just, it was so shocking for you. And all of a sudden, they're here one day and they're gone the next. You see, this church didn't have a proper perspective, a God perspective of death. See, the difference, friends, between the grief of a Christian and the grief of others without hope is the fact that Christian grieve, a Christian grieves with hope. It's not a goodbye. It's a see you later. A Christian grieves with hope. Not goodbye. See you later. Without theological clarity, you will inevitably find theological confusion. Uh, This is why, as a church, we want to be committed to seeing you and me and all of us growing in our walk with Jesus and growing in theological clarity so that we can avoid theological confusion. This is why we do things like SOLA. This is why we have GPS groups so you can learn to live those things out. Knowing, living, advancing the gospel. It's all about helping to develop what we believe, why we believe it, and how we live it out in the world. Called to be what Christ calls us, his disciples. Not sitting back, you know, not doing nothing. Just sort of sitting back waiting. You know, Jesus, you said you'd return and I'm just going to sit and wait. That's not what he's called us to. He's called us a forward momentum to move more and more into holiness. And so that's what we try to do as a church. Even when we gather here on a Sunday morning, we're opening up God's word and we're studying God's word. And we're saying, God, what do you want to teach us this morning? So that we can grow closer and closer to you. So Pastor Paul, he wants us to know that that he wants us to have a theological clarity. He wants these new believers Uh, Not to be ignorant about those who have died who are Christians. And he calls those who died uh, as Christians, he says they have fallen asleep. Now there's a great picture, right? The fact uh, for the Christian is that our grief is is for a temporary loss. The Christian grieves the temporary loss at death with a certain hope of a reunion. That's why you can confidently say it's not goodbye. It's a see you later for those that are in Christ. Now, sleep is a good describer. It's a good picture of what death is like for a Christian. Right? This, this verse, maybe you've heard of this. Uh, um, cults like the Jehovah Witnesses, they, they teach this soul sleep. It's this idea of soul sleep. This is not what Paul is talking about here. So soul, soul sleep teaches that when a person dies, his soul sleeps until the time of the future resurrection. So in this condition, the person is not aware or conscious. Okay, it's like um, they're frozen in time, right? This is not what's taught in the Bible, anywhere in the Bible, right? Sleep describes what death is like for the believer because it's a good picture of what happens, right? So think, think of um, when you see someone at the funeral home, they're very... They're lying there. They look very peaceful at rest. Right? They almost do look like they're sleeping. I remember years ago, we were, uh, Sharon had a cousin who was a funeral director, and we went and visited. You know, you go at night. It's kind of creepy, right, in the funeral home at night, and you go down in the basement where they have all the freezers for the, the bodies, and you can kind of explore, and he gives you a bit of a tour. And I remember being there, and uh, to, to get the bodies from floor to floor, they, they have uh, ones that have more than one floor. They have like a conveyor belt, and the body goes on the conveyor belt, and they move the conveyor belt, and then the body comes off, the, you know, and they do what they got to do and get the body ready and put it in the casket. And uh, I remember there w- one time, Sharon and I, this is, this is many years ago, and I actually had to ask her for the details because I'd forgotten some of it. But I remember being there, a little bit kind of creeped out uh, being there, and, um, and, and we're in the basement, and all of a sudden the conveyor belt comes on. And there's a body on the conveyor belt coming down to us. Well, it didn't take long before we realized it was actually Sharon's uh, older brother laying on the conveyor belt, plain dead. So that's the thing though, right? Bodies, bodies look like they're resting, right? It, it, it's not the soul that sleeps. It's the body that looks like it's asleep. So, so when a Christian dies, the body is viewed as sleeping. It's, it's Sleeping until the resurrection of the dead occurs. So at death, the soul, on the other hand, goes immediately to be with with Jesus. 
And the reason that a Christian has hope is because Jesus gave us hope. All who know Jesus die to be with him. So Jesus is the only person to die and live again. The Bible says that we know Jesus when we die. We get to go and be with Jesus when we die. It's as simple as that. So we don't grieve as ones who have no hope. And Paul wants these Christians to not grieve like the world grieves because Christian grief is altogether different than worldly grief. There is no hope or comfort in fairy tales and myths about death. True comfort only comes when we understand the truth about what happens to our loved ones who are in Christ. Jesus made it clear when a, that when, a, when a, a Christian passes from this life into eternity, they're with Jesus immediately. Here's an example, John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death to life. Or you might look at 2 Corinthians 5, 8. It talks about to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. There's no soul sleep. Your soul is with Jesus when you die as a Christ follower. So Paul teaches teaches them and us to look back and be grateful for what Jesus has done through the cross and the resurrection and then look ahead and be hopeful for what Jesus is going to do. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 14, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Right, those who have died. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Right, those that have already died. So he's saying, those that are living, walking around, like, okay, so us right now, if Jesus was to return right now, those we will not precede those that have already died in Christ. Their, their bodies will come from the grave and they will meet Christ in the air as, as we would living when Christ returns. So, so that's what Paul's teaching us here. He takes us back to the reality of the death and the resurrection of Jesus and says, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, the death and the resurrection of Jesus is the foundation upon which Christianity is built upon. So, so Jesus' death is essential, but the fact that he is raised from the dead is crucial. A dead Jesus does nothing to bring Christians hope. A dead Jesus does nothing to bring Christians hope. So Paul's reminding them and reminding us of this transforming truth. The death of Jesus purchased our redemption. But the resurrection of Jesus proves our redemption. So redemption means uh, to, to free someone from bondage. It's, it, it involves a, you know, maybe a pain of a ransom, a price that ensures redemption. So a price was paid to free us from sin and death. And that price was Jesus himself. His blood was spilled. His broken body was, was, was broken for us. And so, so this is, this is the, the promise that God has for us. He says, because of what Jesus has done, I have purchased your redemption. I've given you life. And that when you pass from this life, you enter to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. And Jesus backed this promise with truth. He not only tells us he loves us, he proves he loves us. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He not only tells us he loves us, he proves he loves us. So since God was faithful to, re to raise Jesus from the dead, this same promise holds true for those that love him. So Paul is saying to them, if you want to know what God thinks about your loved ones who have died, look no further than the resurrection. Because every Christian can and should live with the hope of the resurrection, the hope of this promise. Jesus died and was raised again. And because of that, your loved ones who are in Christ, that die will also rise again. So Jesus' death transforms our death into sleep. 
right? Now, it's a picture, right? Sleep's a picture. Obviously, when you go to a funeral, the person's not sleeping, okay? And you just got to wake them up. No, no. It's a picture that Paul wants us to understand when it comes to the Christian and death, that this is not final. This is not final. Jesus died once for all so that all who look to him would not have to experience death. That's Romans 6, 10. You could look at Hebrews 9, 28. You can look at 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. 1 Peter 3, 18 tells us this. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now, when we die, our body goes to the grave and our souls go to be with Jesus. So Paul speaks of death in terms, like I said, absent from the bodies to be present from the Lord. Now, I don't know this, and I'm not not, um, promoting heavenly tourism or anything like this, but there are a number of times where I have uh, been able to witness people passing on from this life to the next. And I even think about my own, uh, m- when my own mom died, um, she died of cancer and, and my dad t- tells this story. But there's many occasions where a person is, is, is uh, coming to the end of, of their life and it's a- almost like um, as they're, just as they're dying, and s- I-, I don't know, this is, this is truth according to Blair, okay? So don't, th- I'm just saying this is, I don't know, but this is sometimes... I, I just don't know. It's one of those things I'm going to ask Jesus, you know. When you die, it seems like there's this, this time where, where the soul is leaving a person, but the person is still here. And, and, uh, and, and why I say that is, you know, I, I'll use my mom, for example. So when she was passing on, just as she was dying, she, she died with this huge smile on her face. It was as if she had seen something. And, and, and I've seen that many times with people who, who are Christ followers and love Jesus and, and they're dying. And, and at the very end, it's almost like, it's almost like they, they, they get a glimpse into what's the, and it's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. This is amazing. So passages such as ours this morning describes believers being resurrected, given glorified bodies. So if believers go to be with Jesus immediately after death, what's the purpose of the resurrection? It's a good good question. Well, it seems that while our souls or our spirits go to be with Jesus immediately after death, the physical body remains in the grave sleeping. And at the resurrection of of believers, the physical body, our physical bodies, will be resurrected, resurrected, they'll be glorified, and they'll be reunited with our soul and our spirit. So this, this reunited and glorified body, soul, spirit will be the possession of believers for eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. That's what Revelation 21, 22 tells us. So are there lots of questions around that? Well, what is that? What is, what's going to happen? All the, I, I hear you. I hear you. Just so you're, you know, we're, we're actually going to preach through Revelation in September. We're going to start Revelation in September as a little heads up. That's like a trailer, things to come. Okay, verse 16, let's continue, okay? Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Now, this, this describes a picture that was very common in the ancient world. In fact, it's still common today when you talk about a, a king, or someone of, of, of royalty. So there was this, uh, this you know, the trumpet's going to go like... You know, the, the king is here, right? Everyone's cheering. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, it's just this, 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 like this, this royal procession is going to happen. The sound of the trumpet of God, like the king is, is entering. 
Right? There'll be a decree or an announcement by the archangel. There'll be this echoing blast of God's trumpet announcing this approaching king. And at the trumpet's blast and at the announcement, all the bodies of the dead who are in Christ will rise from the grave and ascend to meet King Jesus in the air. And at that moment, all who are in Christ and alive will also be changed in a flash and rise also to meet him in the air. That's why if you're driving a car, maybe that's what will happen. And, uh, you know, who knows? There's, there's many questions around this. Now, the cry of command is likely Jesus commanding all the bodies to rise from the grave. Okay? And, and how do we know this? Well, John 5, 28, 29. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. And they'll come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. The amazing picture is something like this. God the Father brings the souls of believers with Christ and you re reunites them with their glorified bodies and they're raised when Jesus returns. So God so remembers and cares for believers who have died that they're, they're the first ones to be resurrected. We who are all alive, we are who are left, driving the cars, flying the planes, you know, all those things. We're going we're gonna to go up with them, right? And so we're going to meet them in the air. We're going to meet those who have already died. And, and who knows? Maybe we'll be naked. Won't that be quite a show? Okay. So Paul, this is really important to realize, right? Paul did not write this to be with the purpose of being this comprehensive eschatological or end times overview of the Bible. So we can't walk away from this passage expecting to have answers for every question about the end times, but we can identify some truths that this passage makes very clear for us. Jesus is coming again. He's coming for his church, his bride. The dead in Christ will not miss this event. And when he comes, there will be a glorious reunion with Jesus the expectation of this event is the reason why Paul says this is to be an encouragement to you. Verse 18, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another. Jesus is coming again. Encourage one another. He's coming for his church, his bride. Encourage one another that the dead in Christ will not miss this event. Encourage one another that you will have this glorious reunion with Jesus. This is a place of encouragement. A couple of things that Paul lays out for us. He says, we need to have assurance about tomorrow. Right? In, in the latter half of verse 17, so we will always be with the Lord. We have assurance about tomorrow. We have assurance about tomorrow. It doesn't mean that we have the assurance that we're going to be here tomorrow. But we have assurance about tomorrow because all those that are in Christ, when they're absent from the body, they're present with the Lord. The Thessalonians had tremendous uncertainty about the future. They had uncertainty about the fate of their friends. And it had undermined the church. It had robbed them of joy. And they needed assurance. And they needed that assurance quickly. Their questions and their uncertainties about the future were were swallowed up in that word, always, always, always. You will always be with the Lord. Those who die in Christ are with him now. They will be with him when he comes. They will be with him always. And the same guarantees that's offered to those the same guarantee is offered to those who are alive when Christ comes. One can find no greater assurance than to hear that the Lord himself wants nothing more than his children to always be with him. And the second thing he says is we can have hope for our lives today. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Remember, the church is going through persecution, is going through suffering. And, and, and we, we don't even fathom what that was like. But, but if, we, if we were to take it to, to, to today, 
in many of our lives, we're living with a lot of different challenges and struggles. And there's a lot of people in our sphere and maybe in this room that live with a lot of, of hopelessness. Be encouraged by these words. You know, in these six verses, it began, right, at the very beginning of our passage with ignorance, with grief, with hopelessness. And it ends with comfort. And hope is exactly what this passage is all about. Death does not have the final word. The false teachers do not have the final word. Human speculation does not have the final word. Into the darkness of our confusion, God shines the light of his truth. God's truth can transform ignorance into understanding, grief into joy, and hopelessness into assurance. God's promises about tomorrow give us hope for how we face today. One of the questions that I often will ask couples who are struggling in their marriage um, when we get together or whatever, I'll say, well, let's just pause here and let me, tell me, tell me what is it about this person that you fell in love with in the first place? Like, why did you fall in love with them in the first place? And oftentimes people think, you know, thinking deeply about that, oh man, you know, uh, all they see is the immediate and it's, it's often easier for us, isn't it, to become so familiar with someone that we hardly notice them. And then we do that with our, with our spouse often. In a relationship, we become so familiar that we hardly notice them. We hardly are pursuing one another's heart, growing in relationship. We just kind of coexist together. It's easy perhaps to miss their beauty and the gifts that they are and the things that you fell in love with them in the first place because of that familiarity. And when you see something every day, sometimes you hardly even really notice them. The promises of Jesus can become like that in our lives. Jesus made a promise to you and to me. And he told us that he will come back one day and he will take us to be with him. And this promise towers over us from every conceivable vantage point in our lives. If we look, we'll find hope. It is always there. It's no wonder that we struggle to find peace today And we we worry so much about tomorrow. When we ignore his promises, that's exactly what you should expect. But if we truly want comfort, we have to gaze upon his promises. We have to remember his promises and his truth to us. He's coming soon. He's coming for his church. And for those that are in Christ, you have the unquestionable Assurance that you will always be with the Lord. The resurrection of Jesus proves this.